Okay, everybody, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, and I think what I'm going to try and do here is uh, make my presentation large there. That should work for everybody. Great. Okay, so um, welcome to our breakout session here. My name is Jonas Lamas, and I'm the founder of StakerDAO. And also uh, on the uh, um, panel here with me is Christian Arita, who's the StakerDAO uh, product team lead. Um, Christian has a um, uh, Christian is the product lead. He'll he has a talk later today as well, uh, digging into some of the details about how um, how to build uh, cryptocurrency baskets. Um, one of the things that we've done here with StakerDAO, um, and so I won't be covering that part in too much detail. But Christian's here to join us to keep me honest and um, provide some color commentary for the um, for the session here. We've got an hour, I believe, so. Um, we got a lot of con uh, we got a lot of time to fill. We don't necessarily have to take the whole hour, but um, and uh, we would welcome your questions. So if you have any questions, drop them in the chat, um, and we will pull them up. And if you want to get on the video stream uh, and ask some questions or make some commentary, that you'd be welcome as well. Just click on the button that says um, uh, share audio and video, and we'll pull you right into the conversation. Cool, awesome. All right, so StakerDAO. Why did we launch StakerDAO? What have we learned so far? And um, where are we headed? And the uh, obligatory compliance notice that I have to give before all my presentations now is that we're gonna talk to you about um, our company, our products. And in this conversation, we're gonna mention two different tokens, the Staker token and the Blend token, which power StakerDAO. Um, and the key point, obviously, is that we're not giving you any financial advice. We're not offering anything for sale here in this presentation. And in particular, if you're US person, if you are a U.S. person, um, then you're not going to be able to buy the Blend token uh, during its offering. So, having said that, let me launch into the details here. So, what is StakerDAO? Um, so, StakerDAO is a platform for managing financial decision making and financial products in a uh, decentralized and secure and compliant way. And that's the vision and we're working hard to get there. And just right off the top, one of the key questions that people uh, deep in crypto often ask is how decentralized is this project? Um, and so we're gonna try and go under the covers here and give you a good perspective on what's decentralized, what's not decentralized yet, what will probably always remain centralized. It just depends on um, uh, uh, where we are in our timeline of, of a company to, uh, to really be able to tell the decentralization story at different, different, different levels of detail. So StakerDAO itself right now is uh, a project that's live on the Tezos blockchain. Um, it has a token called the Staker token which is uh, also live on Tezos. I think we were the first FA1 token to launch on Tezos, um, at least um, with a, a, a real backed project behind it on mainnet. Um, our, our smart contracts on Tezos went live January 1st of this year, and the token also went live at the same point in time. And on Tezos, we are doing our governance. And we think that Tezos is the best platform to be doing, to be building businesses on from a, from a POS perspective. Uh, it has uh, the, by far the strongest decentralization out there among layer one chains from our perspective. And so we decided to build our DAO on Tezos and run it with the Staker token. And we'll give you details about how that governance model works here uh, in the coming slides. Um, but we also want to um, let you know that the staker token, we, we think of it as also a profit token. So the goal of StakerDAO um, is to run these financial services, but it's also to, to generate profits over time. And, um, and so we're not shy in saying that the token that is this governance token um, will accumulate profits over time. And because we're, because that's the focus of this, a for-profit DAO, um, we, um, we are going to treat it like a security token, at least initially. And treating it as a security token means 
that you can't just buy it. It's not available on any exchange at this point in time. If you want to purchase it, you got to purchase it like you were making an investment in a startup, um, which means there's private offerings and there's documentation and uh, all that kind of rigmarole that goes around with a traditional offering. And so that's what we've done with our staker token so far. We've sold it like we've raised funds for a startup. Um, and we'll give you give you more context in that over time here as well. Um, the the vision, of course, is it would be awesome if um, if 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 Staker was um, uh, and Sam Rat. I see that you have asked to join. So why don't why don't let let us um, let us get through uh, uh, half a dozen slides or so first, and then we will um, then we'll open it up for anybody who wants to ask questions or or talk um, on the panel at that. Point in time. Sound good? All right, thanks. Um, so, um, the goal of Staker ultimately would be to have it w widely decentralized. And um, that's going to depend on a lot of things how far we are able to push the DAO concept, how distributed we are able to drive the governance process, and what is happening in the regulatory regimes around the world that either accepts that as, um, a as a way of doing business going forward or pushes back against that. So that's kind of what we're thinking about with our governance token. On the DeFi product side, you know, the, the process of governance creates new products and we'll, we'll, we'll show you how that works. But we, um, we have our first product that we're bringing to market that's gone through our governance process. It's a token called Blend. Um, it is a, um, it's a basket token that synthetically represents positions in three POS tokens. So it's a basket of Tezos and Cosmos and Algorand at launch. And if you hold a blend token, you're essentially holding the, a mix of those underlying assets. And we'll give you more details about how, how, how that works as well here in this presentation. Um, we, uh, we think that it, there are a number of reasons why people will be interested in, in blend tokens, but one of them is because it simply makes it easier to participate in top POS networks. And while all of us who are on this presentation here today, we're all you know the blockchain leaders, we're all the folks who are the early adopters to this space, there's there's millions of people coming to blockchain over the next decade who are not nearly as savvy about this technology, not nearly as understanding, not nearly as um, sophisticated from a technology perspective, but they're still going to want to participate in these things for a variety of reasons. And so we think there's a whole bunch of new products and services and user interfaces that are going to have to be created that make it easier for the early majority and then the majority to come into this space. And so a product like Blend, we think, is one of an example of many uh, assets that are going to be created over time that help do that. Um, so let me go to the next slide here and talk about why are we launching a DAO. Our grand vision here is that we think that all financial assets will eventually be put on blockchains. Um, we're going to migrate over the next decade or so from a world where almost everything is centrally managed by big corporations or you know uh, hedge funds mutual funds real estate investment trusts banks uh, we're going to migrate where all of the assets that those uh, entities managed are going to be moved onto the blockchain and then uh, the we believe that it's an inevitable that then the management of those assets will become more and more decentralized so um, you know, I don't know when this is going to happen. It's not going to happen in the next five years, but in the next 25 years, we're going to see everything shift from centrally managed financial assets managed by central organizations to the decentralized equivalent of that. And so we're trying to lay down, you know, early versions of technology that can take advantage of that shift that's coming. Why are we focusing on staking? Um, we get this question a lot, you know, those of us who've been involved in the Tezos ecosystem for a long time have have kind of, at least I've had a lot of blinders on for the last two years that I've been working in Tezos and not really spent a lot of time looking outside of Tezos at what Ethereum's doing and uh, what's going on in Bitcoin. But there's um, a, many more people out there who have not really spent a lot of time looking at proof of stake. 
And so when I when we start to talk about our uh, offerings in the context of Ethereum, um, we uh, we get a lot of question, why, why should we care about proof of stake at all? And my answer is that it's a really fascinating set of protocols that have a lot of advantages over what exists today. Um, we uh, the, the previous panel went into you know extreme detail about why different elements of proof of stake make sense and where they think things are going. So I'm not going to belabor the point here, but um, you know, I got really excited about uh, Tezos uh, when I when I would read the white paper back in late 2016. In early 2017, I launched um, a forum called Tezos Community. In 2018, when we went live with the the network, uh, we built the Tezos Capital Baking uh, uh, Baker, which at the time became kind of the, the largest baker in the ecosystem. No longer uh, top 10 because lots has changed in that market, but um, so I've been very focused on it, learning about it, and I think it's a technology set that is going to win. I think proof of stake is going to beat proof of work over time. And I think that uh, the the bubbles that are on this chart here from Tezos, you know, Tezos all the way down, all of these chains have uh, have features that make them uh, compelling to some degree or another. And so um, with this rapidly changing market, with new proof of stake products uh, coming uh coming to launch, even um, uh, 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 new things that are emerging every day, getting funding, um, new assets that probably will be on this chart. Uh, this chart will probably be pretty different in six months from now. Um, we also think that that rapid change means you need to have experts with eyes on this going forward. And um, because of that, <laughs> a managed product like Lend might also be an interesting, interesting area to bring a financial asset around staking for. So what have we what have we learned so far? Um, my first um, learning when we were thinking about building this is we got to focus on governance first. Uh, I think that a number of DeFi products that uh, are out in the market, well-known DeFi products, had great ideas for ways to build clever financial assets or and clever financial asset systems. And they went off and built that stuff and then they backfilled governance behind it once they realized that, oh, maybe we need to decentralize our management of this or at least make it look like we're trying to decentralize it. Maybe um, we need to pull more people into the decision-making process than just a core team. And as a result, I think we've had a really haphazard rollout of governance across a number of DeFi projects uh, across the ecosystem. Um, and uh, as opposed to that, like I said, when you read the Tezos white paper back in 2016, you could see that it was all about governance. Um, and the model that was put in place there um, has really resonated with lots of people and it's really worked very well over the last two plus years that, that that chain has been operating. And so I put up on this slide just a couple examples. The last maker uh, governance vote, well, one that happened in, in late April, had a whopping 2.32% participation rate. Um, despite wanting to be decentralized, if you only have 2% of your, your tokens voting or your people voting, that, 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 that doesn't really seem very, very uh, decentralized to me. Uh, on the left there, um, Compound recently um, restructured how they're managing their governance with their C tokens. Um, they distributed C tokens out to, um, to their investors. Um, and they're also distributing them to through some methodology to other people who are involved in the ecosystem. Um, and they've started asking those token holders to approve changes to the Compound system. And one of the first proposals, I guess here are the first two proposals, one of their investors voted against it, not because they didn't like the proposals, they thought the proposals were great, but they didn't like the process. They didn't, uh, and, and so uh, I think that's an example of, you know, it's gonna take them a while to iterate on something um, to, to get governance right. But on the Tezos front, which is the third chart here, um, you know, uh, Babylon, which was a major, major upgrade that happened uh, last November, had over 83% voter participation. And all of the votes really that we've had on Tezos um, seem to draw at least 70 to 75% participation. 
um, across, you know, 460 voters. The voters are the bankers um, and the bakers represent the token holders. And I think we have, um, what is it? 70 to 80% staking on Tezos. Uh, and so you have a really strong representation of the underlying token holders through the, through the voting process that works on, on Tezos. And so what did we decide to do when we, when we decided to launch, um, uh, 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 Staker DAO, we decided just to steal it, uh, or at least to, to to copy the open source processes that were in place for Tezos, and and really try and reuse those as much as we could for our governance process. We figured if we built governance right, we will use that governance process to come up with interesting ideas of products that we could launch, uh, and our community will be excited about backing those products. And so we launched uh, Tezos. Uh, we launched Staker DAO governance on January 1st of this year. Our governance cycle has a lot of similarities to the Tezos, Tezos governance cycle. We have four phases, just like uh, like Tezos does. We run ours a lot faster. Um, ours runs on a monthly pace. So every month we have one governance process run. Uh, it has four phases. There's a proposal phase, which is the first week a evaluation phase, which is the second week, a voting phase, which is the third week, and a implementation phase, which is the fourth week. And um, all of that happens on chain. And I will sh I will share with you some details of that in a second, just show you where you can see that. But one of the cool things that Tezos did is they built a really nice governance explorer that shows you the history of all of the voting that's gone on on the Tezos blockchain. And um, and then they were kind enough to release that into the open source space. And so we basically took that code and restructured it for our um, our governance process and then launched our own governance explorer, which is um, the StakerDAO governance explorer, which I'll, I'll share in a minute. Now, um, there are definitely choices that we made, which we believed we had to make uh, in order to go live that make our governance process much more centralized than Tezos's governance process. I, I, I think we are definitely, um, there, as I explained to you how this governance process works, you're gonna say there are really key centralization points and we agree. Our goal over time is to work with our token holders to decentralize some of these key centralization points. But in order to get Tezos, uh, in order to get Stakered out out of the gate, in order to get it launched, in order to get a process running where we could start to determine what kind of financial products we want to launch, we, we had to make key choices along that. And so what's happening today is we have a, um, a, a token, the, the Staker token, as, as we mentioned. And we, as a Staker token holder, you can do a couple things with that. One of the main things that you do is you elect the staker council and you do that on chain. And currently the staker council is a five member council and it gets elected once a year. How that changes will be part of the governance process. Do we expand the council? Do we change how the elections happen? Do we change how the voting happens? All that is controllable through governance. But right now it's a pretty simple one token, one vote. Uh, voted once a year, and we have this five-member council, and the council uh, uses the smart contracts that we've written to vote for or against the specific proposals that flow through the blockchain. So number one responsibility for staking, staker token holders, elect cancel, council. Number two responsibility is to help build the proposals that get, get submitted through this process. And here, <clears throat> we've we've uh, diverged from Te how Tezos works uh, for the beginning because our proposals are more um, conceptual and less code-based at this phase of our building of a DAO. And so our proposals are, um, are strategy documents, essentially. We should research this. We should uh, change the variables on something to that. We should launch a new product that does this following thing. And so those ideas get generated through our governance portal and through our forums. And uh, amongst the staker token holders and also from the larger Tezos community and others who are interested, we come up with interesting ideas. And, um, and then those get encapsulated into a proposal 
which is put on chain by the operations team lead. So Christian, who's joining me here, is responsible um, uh, in a multi-sig uh, scenario uh, for loading the monthly proposal onto the blockchain. And so there's a lot of power there. And as opposed to how Tezos works, where um, any um, any uh, anyone who holds a role, I believe it is, can uh, can promote an idea onto the blockchain uh, proposal process. Here, on, in our case, it has we have a gatekeeper, which is our operations team lead. Our goal ultimately is to change that and take the gatekeeper out and make a scenario so that anyone who's a stake or token holder can submit a proposal under certain constraints, but that's not there yet. So we have these proposals submitted, they get discussed in the forums, they get approved or not approved by the staker council, and then the staker operations team is responsible for, um, for, 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 for implementing those proposals. Um, just to show you, uh, let's see if I can do this quick swap here. I'm going to, um, I'm gonna pull up our governance explorer here if I can. Um, let me see if I share this. Uh, application window, go here, share, Let's see if that works. And click twice here. Okay, cool. So if you go to governance.stakerdow.com, you will, um, you'll see our actual uh, explorer in action. For those of you who are Tezos fans, you'll, you'll see that it actually looks quite a bit like uh, tezosagora.org. Um, here's an example um, uh, of well, first of all, you know you can explore all the proposals back to propose uh, back to stage zero that happened on January first, and you can see everything that's gone on so far. Um, the last completed cycle we had in April, um, the proposal was number four. It was about validator selection. So, as we talk talk to you about the blend product that's getting launched, one of the key decisions that the that the staker community had to um, had to dig into and and the uh, council had to validate was um, uh, had to, had to vote on was which validators do we want to use to manage the basket tokens that are in the blend basket the, the Tezos the Cosmos and the Algorand and so we went through a process of collecting suggestions on the forums um, we listened to a variety of um, uh, feedback from uh, from the community uh, we talked to a bunch of validators about their terms. Um, we excluded uh, a number of validators to not have um, have uh, any kinds of issues related to self-dealing. So, for example, my validator, the Tesla's Capital validator, is not part of this. Polychain, who holds a significant position in StakerDAO, uh, their validators are not part of this. Coinbase, um, who has a vote on the council. They're not part of this, so um, we wanted to go with the, you know, the long-standing validator community and Tezos and Cosmos that um, that has really put in the work. We wanted to pull the what we think are some of the best of those pro projects in to manage the assets that are going to be under management. And so there's a fairly complex set of um, algorithms associated here on how we were um, how we were evaluating people, and uh, and and then uh, we posted this on chain. Um, so this went through an evaluation process that is takes place on the forums, which you can go through the discuss link. And then it goes to the voting uh, phase in week three. So this happened between uh, April 15th and April 22nd, as you can see over here. Um, right now, there's five council members. So each of those council members gets one vote. Spencer, uh, Spencer Noon um, is from DTC Capital. Um, Sheshev is from Lemnis Cap. Me, Luke Youngblood is uh, works at Coinbase Custody, and then Olaf from Polychain. These were the initial five council members, and as I said, through our governance process, these these council members will either get reelected or new council members will replace them uh, in Q1 of next year. Uh, will be when the next election process. But here, you you can see that all five of them voted yes for this. Um, you can um, dig in and look at their keys that each of them has um, that they do their voting from. You can track it all the way through on the Tezos blockchain. It's really cool to see um, the, these smart contracts actually in, in action. And then if you go to the implementation phase, you can get a report from the ops team on where they are in their rollout of these, um, 
uh, of these proposals as they happen. Cool, all right, go back to my slides. Uh, one second here. Okay, and back on this, cool. So that's how this process um, works and how it actually shows up on the blockchain. Um, and then, uh, I already talked about the team here now that we, we covered that. I just want to shout out to my awesome operations team that Christian leads. We've got Pat Moore and uh, Jason, all uh, leading team members uh, on the operations side. And then the question came about, OK, that's cool. You got this great governance process running here. But what are you actually going to do to generate those profits that you were talking about for this DAO? What are the what are the offerings that you're going to bring out? And um, we selected as our first offering a fairly complex uh, and challenging product to bring to market. Um, and it uh, it's called Blend. And uh, Blend, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a synthetic token that tracks a basket of proof of stake tokens. Uh, the Blend token itself is initially being launched as an ERC-20 token. So it's being run on Ethereum. I've gotten a lot of uh, pushback from members of the Tezos community about that. And I think it's it's fair to point out that that doesn't really necessarily drive a lot of value into Tezos by having that particular token launching on Ethereum. We have our reasons for doing that amongst the community and the discussion. Um, you know, the, the reality is that there's a rich DeFi ecosystem on Ethereum that a synthetic basket token that provides sort of a stable coin, if you will, related to proof of stake, uh, will find a lot of value on Ethereum. People who hold Ethereum will be able to go long on proof of stake. Uh, people who wanna short it are gonna be able to short that some, somehow, somewhere across the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, but at the end of the day, we also want to see DeFi blossom on proof of stake. Um, shortly after we launch uh, a, a Blend on Ethereum, we're going to launch it on Tezos. We're going to have a uh, we're going to have a um, swap mechanism where people will be able to take their Blend Ethereum Blend and turn that into Tezos Blend. So if if nothing else, maybe we'll pull some of the liquidity out of Ethereum onto Tezos over time as this goes. So uh, the the Blend token itself um, is not is not trading yet, it's not out there yet, but it's gonna be out there soon. And we've partnered with CoinList to, to manage the process of issuing the initial uh, blend tokens. Um, CoinList uh, will be uh, turning on uh, an offering feature for us uh, in mid-May. Uh, mid um, so actually sometime next week, we expect this process to start running. And, uh, and one of the things, as I think I mentioned in my disclosure, is that this offering that CoinList will be running um, won't be open to U.S. persons. So uh, only non-U.S. people will be able to go through their KYC process to be able to purchase these blend tokens. Once they purchase these blend tokens, they're essentially, um, you know, uh, holding a position in these underlying assets, Tezos, Cosmos, and Algorand. Um, the blend tokens as an ERC-20 token um, will be able to move throughout the uh, DeFi ecosystem, but there are also some key things that as a holder of the blend token, you're going to be able to do. One of those is how we handle the rewards that come in for, um, for the tokens, and I'll, I'll cover that in a second here. Um, and so there's there's a number of details associated with how the blend token works that um, we'll save those for a, for another time because we don't really want to. I'm not really interested in digging too deep into the processes of blend here. We're talking about how the DAO works. But uh, at the end of the day, we've created some interesting contracts on Ethereum that will help people eff efficiently manage their blend tokens and eventually also be able to port them in, in, into Tezos. Um, the question we get is why did we pick Tezos, Cosmos, Cosmos and Algorand? Are those the only tokens that you'll ever have in your basket? Um, um, how will this change over time is um, the, sub the subject of Christian's breakout talk later, uh, later today. I think that's at two o'clock, um, uh, at least two o'clock Pacific at least. Um, and he's gonna uh, spend a lot of time talking about how he's, how uh, he's 
evaluating the POS space and the quality of token, different tokens in that space. So that'll be an interesting one for everybody to tune into if you want to go deep into this. Um, but um, the uh, more interesting thing that I wanted to talk about related to all this right now is the um, the way that we are going to be handling the rewards that come in um, from the staking that is done uh, by the selected validators for these um, Tezos, Cosmos, and Algorand tokens that the uh, staker DAO um, holds for the basket token. And so um, this is a, a flow chart here that I put up that kind of explains to you the two different key parties here. We have Staker DAO, which is managing the validators and receiving staking rewards on an ongoing basis. We have blend token holders who are holding their blend tokens. And so what we've created is a model where as the staking rewards come in to, uh, to Staker DAO, they're, uh, they're, they're transferred into USDC. And so the underlying number of assets that Staker DAO holds, the number of Tez, the number of uh, Cosmos and Algorand, that, that will stay fairly steady because uh, rewards will get transferred into coins. Um, and then on a monthly basis, uh, the smart contracts that we run will offer up those coins for auction to blend token holders. And so as a blend token holder, um, you will have a dashboard where you can look at how many uh, USDC are being auctioned um, this month, and you'll be able to um, participate in a auction process where you can sell your blend tokens back to StakerDAO in return for USDC. And uh, by doing this, you are essentially um, cashing out, if you will, on some of your blend tokens. Um, now you as a, a blend token holder get to set the price and the quantity that you wanna sell those back to us at. Now, obviously there is going to be a known net asset value, a NAV for every blend token out on the market, but that NAV may or may not have um, a direct correlation to what the uh, auction prices end up to be here. So on a monthly, basis this process runs there's automatic bidding system that matches um, the blend offerings to the usdc it clears the auction until all the usdc coins are are sold for blend uh, so now um, the blend tokens are now in the hands of staker dow and all of those blend tokens are then burned and what that essentially does is uh, we think it is going to effectively distribute the uh, rewards um, to the blend token holders in a way that uh, allows them to not have to necessarily deal with uh, ongoing income, whether or not it's income or not, obviously is much discussed these days, but uh, they won't have to deal with uh, receiving more tokens on an ongoing basis. Instead, the number of blend tokens will be uh, going down over time, deflationary over time, while the underlying assets will remain the same. And so we think in the, the in that manner, it will, um, you know, it will um, replicate the value creation that you would otherwise get by getting more tokens. So we're pretty excited about that tender process running. Uh, and um, it'll take, you know, with the sale going live uh, in May, it'll take probably 60 to 90 days before that process actually kicks off with all the validation assignments and, you know, uh, 13 cycles on Tezos, blah, 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 to get those rewards in. But eventually sometime later this summer, we're going to see this process running and we're pretty excited about it. Um, we're also excited about proof of stake just as an asset class and a basket as an asset when you compare it to other things that are out there. Um, despite all the craziness in the markets, um, proof of stake has been a really great uh, asset class to be in. And we think this blend basket is gonna be a really great asset to be in as well. Um, and so for those people who are interested, non-US persons in learning more about this, just give me, uh, give me a ping and we'll be happy to talk about that later. Um, just one more slide here and then we will open it up for questions, I believe. Um, 
So where are we headed, right? Um, actually, two more slides. We've got um, the uh, blend token sale going live uh, here in May on CoinList. Um, blends will start circulating on Ethereum in the June, July timeframe. And shortly thereafter, they'll start, start circulating on Tezos as well. And then later in 2020 and into 2021, the governance process will start identifying uh, and focusing on new assets that StakerDAO wants to launch, as well as tweaking the current assets that are in the marketplace. Um, and the election will happen in 2021 as well. So the last slide that I wanted to put up here before we take questions is just kind of the longer term roadmap on where we're going as an organization. Um, I'm gonna let Christian, uh, who's the product lead for, uh, for us, talk about where uh, he thinks the community uh, has interest in, in driving Staker down. Cool, thank you. So as you can see on the slide, we have lots of ideas and there's a really grand where this could go ultimately over time. Uh, you know, I think we have a particular interest in POS because there's so many technical complexities and so much to keep up with. And it's why we launched with Blend initially, but other iterations you can think about related to that include like region specific POS baskets or even lower market cap POS. Our initial Blend basket is really kind of a blue chip offering kind of just uh, by market cap assets within that basket. I think what we're seeing within our forums and within our telegram, which again is the best way to kind of involve yourself in the discussions is there's an interest around a potential stable coin um, and what that might look like. So starting to think about whether it should be decentralized, centralized, what we should peg to, and all these various kind of patients uh, around it. I think one other project that we've been working on in conjunction with Chorus One is around liquid staking. And the way we've been thinking about that is, can we create a, a blend like probably to a single asset like Tezos and Cosmos for uh, those who might not want that diversification aspect and don't want the index, but are very sure about their investment within a particular network. But you know, maybe you want to participate uh, in synthetic Tezos by using it as uh, additional yield through lending or leverage. And so those are thinking about, um, you know, Jonas, is there anything else you're excited about that you might uh, want to talk about? I know you've been thinking about uh, NFTs and kind of VR, if you might want to comment in that space. Yeah, unfortunately, I've kind of gone down the uh, the NFT uh, art rat hole recently. Um, there's just so many interesting projects that are getting built out in that space, all very early, of course. And whether or not any of that stuff is ready for prime time from a financial product perspective, un uncertain. But I have no doubt that the coronavirus uh, keeping us all at home has led a lot of people to explore um, um, some of the virtual worlds are out, that are out there. I've got my Oculus sitting right over here. Um, crypto voxels, shout out to them and uh, the work that they're doing and all the cool art folks. I really hope we see um, we see the emergence of some NFT uh, products on the proof of stake chains. Um, but um, but uh, in general, uh, I think down the road, there's going to be all kinds of cool things related to NFTs as well. Cool. All right, everybody. So um, I think we've got two people who want to join us on the panel here. So I'm going to um, let them come on board and uh, we'll, we'll get questions from them. If anyone else wants to join the discussion, you can just request to be on the panel. We'll also be pulling questions here off of the uh, chat group. So we've got another 15 minutes here for our panel um, and we'll take it from there. So um, let me turn off this screen here and then let's have Young Min come on. Let's see if I can do that. Brian can you come on if you if he's available. Um, I guess neither of them kid came on. Uh, well, I clicked on them, but I think maybe they they decided to bail there before um, before they could come on board. So let's see what kind of questions do we have, Christian? Do you see anything in the chat? Yeah, here? I mean, in session, the first one we're seeing is, you know, on the three-year safe harbor proposal that the SEC commissioner uh, put out around this. And, and this was the uh, proposal related to having three years to reach some kind of metric around decentralization where projects uh, might be able to grow. Uh, so. Any thoughts on that, 
and how you think about it and how that looks for a project like us who is to you know, pursue kind of a more very regulatory compliant uh, and secure route as opposed to other projects? Yeah, I feel like most of the last year that we've spent kind of figuring out sticker down, getting it launched, like it's been way too focused on regulation and not enough focused on building technology, unfortunately. I mean, we built some cool stuff, but gosh, we spent a lot of time talking to lawyers. Um, and, and that's because we're trying to contort ourselves into a, a way that we can do this stuff successfully, but not, you know, get crushed by regulatory um, regulatory issues and the jurisdictions that we're going to operate. Um, mm -hmm. You know, StakerDAO itself is a Cayman Corporation now. Um, our token issuing entity is a BBI entity. Um, we're doing it under a reg S offering, so it's not available to us persons. Um, and we're not the only ones pursuing this. Every token project is, is pursuing similar models these days, unfortunately. Um, so I would welcome, um, any kind of regulatory clarity and any kind of experimental opportunity like the safe Harbor proposal it would be fantastic. Um, I, uh, I don't think that it would, um, I, I don't think it would open the floodgates arbitrarily to more risk to US investors than what they already have the ability to, to take on board. But I think it would mm -hmm. give those of us who want to launch cool startups in the United States or with US, you know, with US um, people involved, um, a lot more comfort to be able to do something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think most of us in most of us in the space probably feel pretty positively about it. You know, unfortunately, it seems like you know, other commissioners and and other people on the board might not share the same feelings. But overall, I think it's something all of us want to see so that we can innovate. And um, I see that you know, there's another question by uh, Daniil, and he's asking if you can comment on why exactly we chose the auction model for the blend token. Really, what kind of behavior we wanted to motivate there or just the intention behind that? Yeah, so um, why did we choose the auction model for distributing um, rewards? Um, I think there's a couple of uh, reasons why we chose that. Um, one is because um, we wanted to make it really uh, easy for, um, for, for folks to hold the blend token, obviously without having to deal with um, under, you know, the underlying specific wallets and changing quantities of those, but also create some gaming mechanisms for um, how people will value things in this ecosystem, I guess. Um, so there are going to be some folks who will want to participate in this auction process and those people who do may get um, may be able to sell back their blend to us at a price that's higher than what the nav is and that's interesting for them on the other hand um, there will be people who will be less participatory and they will be able to they will not have to do that but they will still get the advantage of the um, deflationary supply of blend. Um, and so I think that's a, we're, it's an experiment that we kind of came up with in the community to see how um, different behaviors modify things. And, and um, I think there's also, you know, this interesting experiment where the, so, so when you participate in the coin list offering, um, as a non-US person for these blend tokens, you get an account with them, you've gone through their KYC process. Um, and those people are the ones who are gonna be able to participate in this, um, this, this uh, auction process, if you will. Um, and so those folks have a value proposition associated with being, uh, uh, with acquiring their blend directly from, um, from us through this, through this controlled process. Some of those people will end up floating their blend into um, the DeFi ecosystem. 
uh, and those holders won't won't be able to participate in this auction process unless they come in and they get they get registered for it. And so um, we just think it's an interesting um, potential mechanism um, that mm -hmm. um, that we want to explore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, got another question from Theo. Uh, do you see the staker token model applied to cases beyond DeFi and what's listed on your community driven roadmap slide? If so, which do you find most promising and worth exploring? And so maybe I can tackle uh, a bit of this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of like DeFi projects that we find interesting, particularly because it's where our expertise and it's we think where we could have a comparative advantage. But the I think the grand vision again, kind of coming back, is kind of this centralized type of asset manager, if you will. And so we really think that in a decade or maybe beyond a decade we're gonna be able to see other assets in traditional markets like stocks, bonds, and real <clears> estate <throat> uh, flow into blockchains, and then ultimately be able to have kind of, whether it's indexes or just, you know, single use products um, of those types. Uh, now. And so we're not limiting ourselves to DeFi. I think that's where we wanna begin, but over time, uh, we don't think there's really any boundaries on what we might be able to create. Jonas, is there anything else you want to add to that? Um, I agree with you, Christian. I think that the um, there's a lot of real world assets that are going to be managed by DAOs down the road. Um, how how StakerDAO gets involved in that remains to be seen, based on what the community's appetite is. Yeah. And I and I, you know, in terms of participation and governance and how we get involved in that. So today, you know, our council is five members strong. How do you kind of envision that growing over time? You know, how the community might get involved. Uh, just your general thoughts. Yeah, um, I uh, the five member council was a real easy, easy governance 1.0 model for us to get launched. Um, I think there's all kinds of more complex models that over time could develop depending on the success of StakerDAO and uh, how our assets grow over time. Um, I, I could see a world where there are multiple council types of things representing different decision making areas uh, across StakerDAO. I know we already have a couple of um, Staker token holders who are big in the NFT space, and they're thinking about forming a subcommittee um, to be able to start proposing NFT-oriented projects and to start evaluating NFT uh, purchases, for example, for uh, the Staker token holders. Um, so that's all something that could get built, built out and run on chain. Um, so I think the process is going to evolve a lot over the next couple of years. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think we're on the same page with that, with how we're moving forward. Um, and, you know, I guess to that point, you know, we've talked a lot about how DeFi kind of exists uh, within the Ethereum space. Um, we obviously have Staker on the Tezo side. So curious about your thoughts in terms of how you see DeFi kind of unfolding within the Tezos ecosystem, what you're really seeing there, and, and maybe if you could just give us any thoughts overall on how you see this developing over time. Uh, for Tezos or for Staker as a whole? Yeah, I think I think Tezos is at a real critical time now to um, to accelerate its DeFi uh, offerings. Um, uh, I uh, we have a we have a well functioning foundation now. We have um, a solid chain out there with a growing set of developer languages. We have um, a growing base of people who know how to program in it. We just need um, we need some real creativity to start launching projects on on Tezos, and I know there's lots of projects in the works. I I just um, mm -hmm. it, am excited about seeing them emerge. Projects like um, Dexter, which is a decentralized exchange that's coming to Tezos, um, the USD TZ is that what it was called? I think uh, token that uh, that's right. That Kevin recently announced on Tezos, uh, which is a USDC backed stable coin on on Tezos, um, went live yesterday, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know all kinds of projects from like um, Kathleen Brightman's um, um, collectible card game that she's that was, launching. Right. Yeah, uh, hopefully that'll come out on Tezos. Um, to uh, a whole bunch of re uh, real estate um, uh, 
tokenization projects that are going to be security tokens. But those, um, I, I, from what I've heard from the people in the know, you know, there's a ton of those things coming. So um, how that all plays out is going to be really interesting. Will the Tezos ecosystem mirror the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem? Probably not. Um, I think mm -hmm. if you're, uh, Ethereum's had a great world of, uh, of ex uh, exploration and testing and building all kinds of really interesting uh, DeFi models, some of which have crashed and burned, some of which are doing pretty well. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Tezos is a fast follower in that world and um, teams are incented to build the best ideas that Ethereum had and rebuild them in a way that makes sense for the proof of stake world. Um, so that's probably where I see this thing going over the next couple of years. Right, might even be a similar model to us where we take the best parts of other systems uh, and bring it to use ourselves that other developers might do with Ethereum. Um, but anyways, um, for everyone on the call, we have maybe about four minutes left. Um, get in your questions if you have any, I see two in the chat. Uh, Jonas, John is asking, you know, is StakerDAO interested in developing derivative tokens and markets for them? Uh, I think John is asking Christian that question. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, what do you think, Christian? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I would even consider Blend a derivative type of token, right? It's more like a synthetic while we have it fully backed by the underlying collateral. Um, you know, it's not actually immediately redeemable for it. So think of it more like a derivative and so I think we'll see other types of tokens like this that we put forward, whether it's kind of like a single synthetic for Tezos or other types of derivatives like that is kind of yet to be seen. I'm not sure if we want to build markets for them. We think there are plenty of other projects and teams in the space that have strong exchanges, strong market making teams that can ultimately um, build for that use case. But if it's needed and the community wants it, we're fully open to exploring that. And so nothing's off the table. Uh, Hopefully that yeah. answers uh, John's question. Cool, cool. And I see more uh, who's uh, our marketing lead is in the chats and she's putting in the links to our uh, our social feeds. So everyone is welcome to um, to check those out. Okay, I think um, what well, we got Andres asked, why is the token blend burnt after its exchange for USD? Why not reuse it? That's a great question, Andres. Uh, the, the, the theory here is that by taking the blend token out of circulation, um, you are decreasing the um, number of blend tokens that are in the market. And therefore, um, every blend holder that still holds a blend token um, has more value uh, associated with that blend token. And so that having that more value associated with that one blend token would be very similar to having the equivalent blend over here in Tezos, right? And having this, that, that, you know, the same value at the beginning and then rewards are generated through the baking process and those rewards come to you. If you're holding the Tezos, you have more Tezos. So you have more value. If you're holding the blend, you have fewer blend in circulation representing the nav. And so you have more value. So it's an equivalent value exchange, if you will. Um, and the burn model is required to do that. If we didn't do the burn model, then, um, the value uh, accrual wouldn't be happening here on the blend token side as well. I hope that makes sense. Okay, everybody, thank you for your time here today. We are going to leave it here, hop back over to the main stage, which I think is gonna start in the next minute or two. Uh, and we look forward to uh, talking with y'all. Um, love to hear what your thoughts are on this going forward. So thanks everybody. Thank you everyone.